Yeah, I, I've always been skeptical of resveratrol, and it, it partly goes all the way back to you know, when I finished my postdoc, we started, I went back to studying aging when I was an assistant professor at University of Washington, and Matt Caberline, who I mentioned earlier, had come there as a postdoc. So we decided that this try to figure out a way, we found a few long-lived mutants in yeast, this try to screen the whole yeast genome now, and look at all the deletion strains and figure out which ones are long-lived. That turned out to be a 13-year process. <laughs> but but um, at the start of it, what we wanted to do was uh, um, think, just have all of the interventions that we know work working in the lab. And so we overexpress sir 2 it extends lifespan. We delete FOB1, it extends lifespan, et cetera, et cetera. But we couldn't get resveratrol to work. Uh, and uh, It didn't extend lifespan in yeast. And other people have also... So it was initially reported to do that, but we've never been able to repeat that. And then there were in, uh, people doing uh, uh, biochemistry saying that uh, resveratrol doesn't activate SIRT1 or SIRT2, the, the human and the yeast enzyme, respectively, uh, against uh, peptides that were acetylated. Now, the original screen that was done was with a acetylated peptide that had a fluorescent moiety on it, and they had a really neat chemistry. The screen was great, had a really neat chemistry that when you deacetylated the peptide, it, it activated the fluorescent group, and you could score that uh, very easily in a screen. And that worked, but when you took peptides without that fluorescent moiety, it didn't work anymore. Uh, and so uh, we published the paper. Another paper got published after that saying the same thing. Uh, and uh, then later, you know, David Sinclair has gone back and shown that uh, there are substrates that have bulky amino acids that are similar to that fluorescent moiety and their position relative to the acetyl group. And that for those substrates, SIRT1 activates it and that our resveratrol would presumably activate SIRT1 or that. We haven't gone back and followed that up. Um, uh, and uh, I think that the other problem with resveratrol is it's a very dirty molecule. It does all kinds of different things in the cell. And so I, I kind of think most of the fields move beyond it now. And uh, uh, I'm still skeptical. Uh, other people will tell you their benefits. But uh, the, the field has moved more toward, you know, NAD and NAD precursors and trying to <clears throat> use those as a means to activate sirtuins and affect aging. Yeah, that's kind of the conclusion that I've come to um, by looking at the data and actually what, yeah, the, the process or well, the, the timeline of events with the initial resveratrol excitement and then, yeah, research such as yourselves that said, well, hang on, maybe this, it's not quite that simple. Um, I think the paper yeah. that really seals it for me was one that was published last year in 2020 that used um, CRISPR technology to actually have a look at what resveratrol is actually activating and, and, and mm -hmm. how is it actually working. And overall, that paper was suggesting that the, the primary method of how resveratrol works is the induction of low-level replicative stress. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, which may be true. And, and But this is how science works, right? I mean, you have someone publishes an observation, people try to replicate it. Often it's hard to replicate because there's some condition that's different or some way the experiment's done. And at the end of the day, you know, there may be a few uh, hump, uh, um, bumps along the way, but you get to more understanding. So I, I think that uh, um, it's always, the people get nervous when there's controversy in a field, but it's not a bad thing. Uh, you know, you need different labs with different viewpoints uh, discussing things and trying to come to the right answer in the end.